Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. This episode is sponsored by A Stotts Academy, which offers online courses that help investors, aspiring professionals, business leaders, and even beginners to improve the finances of their lives and their businesses. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now to claim your discount on the course that excites you the most, fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, and I'm here with featured guest, Mighty Pete Lunton. Pete, Mighty, Mr. Mighty, Mighty Pete, are you ready to rock? I certainly am, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an absolute privilege and slightly nervous, but looking forward to it. Yes, and uh, we were just joking before the show that you can tell when someone doesn't know you because they send you an, a message and they say, hey, Mighty, I really liked your latest episode. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? You know, it's amazing how... Uh, you know, when there's, there's not a person behind it, you don't necessarily notice the intricacy. So it's a nice way of knowing if you're getting a personal message or uh, you're maybe just part of a system, let's just say. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me introduce you to the audience. So Mighty Pete from Fire in the Belly Show is an author, soon to be TEDx speaker, podcast host, mentor, entrepreneur, property investor, husband, and father of three beautiful girls. Pete's background is in project management and property, but his true passion, ladies and gentlemen, is the fire in the belly show and project. His mission is to help others find their potential and become the mightiest version of themselves. Pete openly talks about losing both of his parents, suffering periods of depression, business downturn, and burnout, and ultimately his years spent not stoking fire in the belly. In 2017, at 37.5 years of age, that changed. And he's now on a journey of learning, growing, accepting, and inspiring others. Mighty Pete, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Wow. That's, um, listen, first, it's, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I think what's, what really stands out for me is I've, I've got this obsession, this burning desire in my life. And that's come at 37 and a half years of being what I would now call average. And I did listen, I've achieved a fair amount. And a lot of people would say, well, is, you know, is that not good enough? And it doesn't matter what you say. It's quite often as you know, inside yourself. And, you know, it's the last three, four years now has been so enlightening to actually see what my potential is. And like a good asset, you know, and you let it compound, you let your lessons and your learnings compound and you grow over time. You know, when you can potentially project forward where you're going to, I see the 37 and a half is almost being my, the midpoint of my life statistically, give or take. So I'm kind of going, yeah, I could see where I'm going to end up. But what I do love is when you ask the questions, what if, mm -hmm. what if you tried something different? What if I read a book every day? What if I did this or did that? And it's sort of saying, what could the compound effect do? What, you know, could we bring on board? What could we learn? So that's some of the stuff I do and I love it. And before I was saying, you know, I'm done with education and done with reading. Now it's like, I'll be, I'll still be reading in the grave, you know, <laughs> till my dying day, I'll be doing it. So it's awesome. Love it. Yeah. And a real hunger for life. You remind me of uh, the, when I was young, I fell into, I stumbled into a 12 step program. And that was to deal with my addictions. And basically they had something in it called the 12 promises. And it started like this. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We will know a new freedom and a new happiness. We won't regret the past nor wish to shut the door in it. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us and we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? And so those are the promises. And when I heard those promises, I said to myself, I want all of them. <laughs> I want all of them. And so, you know, when you said I like kind of average and, you know, I did okay, you know, and it made me think that, you know, that, that moment when I heard that the first time, I thought I want all of them, but there was this, this word combination <laughs> that came at the beginning of that, if we are painstaking 
in this phase of our development. And that really told me, um, you know, if you switch that around, taking pain, you know, if we're willing to take the challenge and, and face the pain, then we can develop so far in our life. So I think that, you know, that is to me a lot about accepting that, uh, saying that I want more out of life, be willing to face the challenges, the pain, the struggle, and you will get so much more. It's couldn't say it better. I mean, is yourself in five years going to thank you for what you did today? Amen. You know, well, let's hope so. I think ourselves are going to thank us for what we're about to do. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and I believe that our listener is going to thank five years from now is going to thank himself for listening to this to make sure that they have not made a major mistake. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, what I'm about to say has not been said publicly and it happened not that far away, but to give you a little bit of background, um, I started investing in property uh, 20, over 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, so 20 years of age. And that's always been something that's worked for me in the background. For me, property investing is a bit like monopoly. You collect the rent, you pay the mortgage, and anything that's left over then is nice. You get a few rates and taxes and a few things that sneak up and catch you out, but that's the principle. So through my life, that's essentially what I did. And it was a side hobby. I had my own professional career. So the, hobby, the houses were just there in the background. And I, it, was a, it was a perfect, beautiful way of just um, letting people uh, go through that and you know, building that up. So the more houses I had, you know, someone said to me, if you've got one, you might as well have four. If you've got four, you might as well have 40. So that's kind of the principle I worked on. In fact, scale happens and it gets better. So really, that's, that's what happened to me. I built it up and built it up. And luckily enough, really, um, I had a full professional career and the houses and the properties all sort of worked away. So it was quite simple that I always said the properties, as long as they supported themselves and I had a job and I supported myself, then that was sort of a great investment vehicle. That was all great. And then a lot of things started happening. And as I mentioned, 37 and a half years of age, I had basically depression we lost the business and, and what we were doing and a number of reasons but that's a that's a, another story but what happened is i found myself with a bit of time on my hands now we had a very successful property formula and the likes of any formula was it was super simple so to give you an idea i, I generally have two factors i look for a 10 percent gross yield and we look for our money back out in three years we retain the asset but we add value or we buy under value to bring it back up to value so Anyone who's used to investing will understand that. That's my formula. Very simple. So you could drive up a street and you could pick out which house is mine because we're very clear. You know, I buy mid-terrace. It's always two or three bed. We always add value. We do this. That's fine. It's great. Fast forward then to uh, July, June, June last year, June 2019. And suddenly I find myself with a little bit of time on my hands because like any good investment, the best thing you can do is invest and leave it alone. So suddenly I had a bit of time. Our business had been shut. A little bit of cash around and a few opportunities. And I'm doing a lot of networking and finding out what my sort of, my fire in the belly is. And funny, fire in the belly had been born just before that. So like any investor, any entrepreneur, when you have time and you have a little bit of money, you suddenly become a bit of a, a weird animal. So uh, that's when... An opportunity came to me. I had the opportunity to meet somebody who was a much bigger investor than me. Now they were at a very interesting point in their life that they were sort of what should have been heading towards retirement. So into their eighties, um, portfolio wise, were probably ten times the size of my portfolio, and but they were very, very humble, very open individual. So I got a chance to meet this person. And there was a lot of talk of you know potentially you know. Let's just say we resonated. We were able to have a great conversation and things like that. So that's actually the first thing. When you're sitting down with someone, you get rapport. Okay. So any sales, you start and going, okay, I like you. Yeah, this is fun. We can have a chat, you know? So that's fine. So very quickly, then it sort of the conversation expanded and, and there was opportunities, let's just say. You know, there was a desire to start offloading his portfolio. There was other things coming up. And then, like I say, that's when the opportunities start to come. So there was a number of things that were ring fenced and I was invited to go and have a look at the properties with a view of potentially doing a deal. 
Now, that was fine. And one in particular, because of, there was an event that was going on uh, locally at the time, and it was the, 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 um, the Open, the Golf Open, was coming to a location in Northern Ireland. And as a result, the accommodation was under severe demand. You know, when I say severe demand, you're basically taking a normal rental figure and multiplying it by 10 or 20, something crazy, right? So straight away, you have a, you've got another factor come in. So we now have rapport. We have the actual issue of unbelievable returns, you know, so you can start seeing what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Fast track, we're on a time crunch at this point. So you're adding time restrictions. Okay, so here we go. So this deal has come up and I'm getting, you know, a lot more sort of brought into it. And there's a lot more going on. And so then we start to actually work out the potential structure of a deal. In the space of this all happened over 12 days from me meeting this person to eventually the conclusion that I'll bring you to. Very quickly, I saw the property as I would do, it's now it was outside of my normal profile of investment. That's the other thing I need to say. Mm. But we're feeling good. We're seeing lots of opportunity. We're getting lots of nods, lots of green lights and lots of hope. Okay. And this is where hope is built on hope. And that's another thing I would say to people, just be mindful. Fast track forward, we basically then start, we come to a deal. Okay. okay. And the deal is that um, it's structured in such a way that it becomes like a, a payment plan. So suddenly it becomes affordable, hmm. okay? And that's another thing. It suddenly is kind of going, how can I have something that's really outside of reach? And oh, look, we have payment options. Okay, so suddenly we have this. So the deal that was structured was basically a five-year lease uh, with an agreement to buy. So that gave me five years of a head start on that, on a lease agreement, then basically the, the sale price in five years was pre-agreed and the, the commitment for them to buy and the opportunity for me to, or for them to sell and the opportunity for me to buy. So that meant any investment we did was to our benefit. So that's great. So suddenly you've actually broken down the deal, something larger than normal. So this is a property that basically could, um, you know, it, it had the opportunity of being about a sort of 30 to 40 bed um, guest house type of accommodation, you know, mini, mini hotel, if you like. Um, but also it had another extra deal, a little deal bonus. It had the opportunity for the building to be knocked down and built into 10 apartments. So here was, you know, at this point I'm sort of saying, this is great. So we have a potential upfront cash flow. We have a long-term prospect for, a, a, you know, a cash, you know, a, a sellout, a buyout, et cetera. So there's, it had short-term potential and long-term potential. So at this point, you go on, listen, the world's a lot. The universe is bending for me. This is brilliant, you know? Now, as you do, and you start working up your figures and things are going along and you think, fantastic. And, and then the coffee's flowing and the opportunities are flowing. And I'm starting to, I'm enabling teams. So I have teams of people who are looking at it. I have teams of you know, legal guys who are doing what they do. And everything that was impossible suddenly became possible. Contracts that I said, you know, I needed drawn up within 10 days. So that, that gave us the time to prep the building ready for these exponential returns for renting at this particular time. So we have this. So again, so suddenly there's people that couldn't do it, but they had a colleague who could do it. And they were actually able, they were versed in bringing all this paperwork and contracts together. So suddenly we were finding stuff that should have taken a month was suddenly getting done in three days. And it's the universe just wants this to happen for me. How fantastic, you know, even even getting funds. So I have funds and, and going there, but I didn't have the, the cash available at short term, but I was able to get the cash at short term. And again, something else and people were willing to do it. So how many signs from the universe do you need before eventually you go, wow, this is just fantastic. I could go, wrong. go back and say, this is outside of my, exactly. It's outside of my normal portfolio, but everything's happening for me. Okay. The numbers only worked. Okay. If we had that sort of premium income, so that's the one thing I was aware of. There was, you know, after that was hope value. You know, it was, yeah, could, should, maybe, hopefully. Okay, so that's the one thing. And very quickly, things started going together. And I was conscious of, and this is the one thing I suppose I have learned in 20 years of property is like, if something is a rush, why is it a rush? You know, because contracts take time, things need to mature, things need to ferment. And some people are very quick decision makers. I'm slightly different. I can be very easily influenced, but I do like to sort of 
we're tracked back into my cave. I have the committee of me. We all get together. We have a chat, feel if this is right, and then come out. I do not respond well to being pushed. But what was happening here is I was actually pushing me as much as the client was giving me the opportunity to do it and the outside environment was doing. So everyone was in this sort of forward motion. Brilliant. Okay. Life is fantastic. So we've got unbelievable time pressure. We've got, you know, opportunity. We've got distraction because I'm not necessarily thinking about the big picture. I'm thinking about how do we get this done? So I'm straight into doing phase. I'm not into, you know, I'm not looking at the, the bird's eye view. I'm on the ground. I'm, I'm sort of pushing the phone calls and making it happen. You get a bit of pride. Suddenly I can swell the portfolio a nice bit and you've got this and sort of promises of gold and fortunes and, you know, everything's glistening around me. And it's, You're going to you look know, damn smart when this deal's done. Oh, listen, I mean, and it's this, and bearing in mind, this is the start of a beautiful journey with this particular client because they have so much more where this comes from. You know, so I'm suddenly, I'm feeding away at the trough and I'm having a great time and, and things are good. So as we get to the stage and, and we're literally at the stage where the, the solicitors and, and the, the lawyers are picking up the phone and going, we're good to sign on Friday. But by the way, the, the head lawyer, uh, he's not around on Friday. Okay. You kind of going, okay, but I've got my, 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 my number two is lined up and we're, we're good to go. Okay. At this point, finances are already sitting with my solicitor ready to transfer. That's how, you know, we were committed. So that was a year's lease payment up front. We always had to be. So, you know, and you're talking tens of thousands. It's not just a small payment. Um, and everything, all else, the commitments are going with it. A few things just start to feel a bit funny. So we had asked for access to the building. That's fine to enable some of the trades to actually quote. We get one of the first quotes back. It's from the cleaning company. And this is where the building that was sort of prepped and was I was sort of told, and I have viewed the property at this mind, mm. but my glasses are very rose tinted. I'm mm -hmm. looking at this thing of going, I'm seeing it all. And listen, you don't understand. I'm seeing big picture here and I'm seeing this and the opportunities are coming down the pipeline. So my rose tinted glasses come back and I get the phone call from the cleaning company and the cleaning bill alone is 10 times what I had budgeted, 10 times. And I am sitting here and I'm going, you don't understand. I'm trying to do this. You're not making it happen. Blah, 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 blah. It's your fault, not mine. What's going on? Okay, that's the first thing, right? We need a new cleaning contractor. These guys are not cooperating. Okay, they, they basically just, they're just pricing themselves out. Okay, it's not me, it's them, you know? So that's fine. So a number of things start to happen like this and you can go, well, that's a weird bit of feedback. And then, you know, but again, we're still getting good, good sort of responses from the universe and feeling okay about it, but certain things are starting to jar a little bit. Thankfully, because of the delay with the solicitor, getting things lined up, I had the gumption to say, my main solicitor, listen, nothing needs to be done that quickly. You know, I don't care who you are. We have, you know, we have a, a, a an a, a principle and agreement or uh, an agreement in principle, we had a handshake. Okay. Now, depending on where you're at, handshakes can mean different things. In Ireland, the handshake is as good as your bond. Mm. Okay. So I now have emotional commitment. I have some financial commitment. I have commitment to the people around me. You fast track to the Friday, the Friday where the head lawyer is away. We've just, we've taken the decision and said, let's and it can wait to next week. I want to just let this sort of let the dust settle a little bit because it's nothing's that urgent. Things are just going to happen. So be it. And that's fine. We've told the cleaning company to disappear because they're basically trying to rub us blind and do all this. I then decide going, I am conscious that I am so far into this deal that I can't see my own backside. And kind of going, I need, I need to break the echo chamber. You know, I need to break March here and I just need someone else to come in and give me a fresh pair of eyes because I know my head is so far in the trench, I'm not seeing anything. Because we were down to doing the deal, do the deal, do the deal. Opportunities are, gold is going to flow and everything's going to come. So come the Friday, thankfully, I assemble friends, family, peers, confidants, colleagues, etc. down at this particular building and go on, give me, what am I missing here? What's What are the things that are going to catch me out? The feedback within minutes was, it's a pig. It's a pig in lipstick. It's basically, you're seeing something. You're seeing this thing that can be dressed up on a budget, on a small budget. It can be brought to light in a very short period of time that it has this sort of flowing of gold. 
you haven't shown for this, this has not happened, certain licenses have expired, certain things have not happened. And suddenly I, my ego is going, what do you guys know? You know, you don't understand, you don't see the big picture, you don't see all this. Over the next two hours, I had the biggest wake up call. And it was the whole thing got pulled and it was enough of a shock to actually snap me out of this, you know, it was almost like the perfect sales process. I was in, I was hypnotized. The deal, the deal, the opportunity, there's the time stack. We've stacked hope on hope. And I was like, I hope when we get that to happen, then that'll happen and that'll happen. And like I say, I'm just, and I'm, I've got my big picture. I've got a short picture. I've got, you know, I can iron out all the risks. I can do this. And I'm, I'm literally bending the universe. I'm bending the universe to make this happen. Uh, interesting so, because earlier you said the universe was bending for you. But now you're starting to see you're bending the universe. Exactly. And that's so, so key. I wanted it too much. I want, you know, it was not, I was blindsiding. I was blasting through all the roadblocks and things like that. And people go and listen. And that was the thing, you know, so I very quickly got this sort of slap in the face with my ego and suddenly you're going, maybe you want this too much. Maybe you're not seeing it for what it is. You know, everyone else is going, I don't know what you see here, but this thing, this is a pig and lipstick. You know, it really is. And it's like, this is not getting made into a nice purse any day soon. So we have all this going on. So suddenly I'm getting this realization because financial commitments, contracts are, are literally sitting and we have, we've committed to the, the, the lightest form before we actually commit as in paperwork's being prepped, money sitting on. on it starts on to get harder to get out. Yeah. And it's without swearing on your show, it's kind of that time to do the proverbial or get off the pan, right? Yeah. You know, so it's going through and that that's the thing. Now, I've had this before in deals where, you know, it can be a flood of excitement. There's a bit of kind of going, right, I need a stiff coffee because it's an investment. And yes, I've stacked my risks and, and I've done all that, but I've had time. I've got myself okay with it. Yeah, stiff coffee and right, sign the paperwork. Good, I feel good. At this point, I've now got this negative feedback thrown into the mix and it just is that drop of water in this diesel engine this thing is chugging along and it's coming and it's dealing it's big and it's opportunity but suddenly it's like a misfire and you can it's enough to snap to snap my mindset and going whoa, whoa, whoa hold on for one person around me to see it and i i don't almost know how I, it's you know whether it's maturity whether it's luck universe whatever you want i had enough people from different angles so i had my wife was there I had a trusted friend that was there. I had people I've done business with that was there. And they're all sitting here and they're, they're actually echoing the same thing. So I've broken March in my own echo chamber. You know, we talked about this is when you have your committee of 12 or you're committing your mind or whatever, you need diversity of opinion because otherwise you're just going to get this echo chamber. And everyone going, it's brilliant. You're brilliant. Fantastic. Had it not been for that, I then have a very hard and long drive to go down to see the client. I'm rubbing my head. Like that's one of the reasons I have less hair now than ever. And I'm sitting here going, I'm in this, where do I go? What do I do? And in my head, it's screaming, get out, get out, get out, get out. I've shaken the man's hand. So suddenly now I've got my other core values at play, my ego, my pride, my integrity, everything else has come into play. Now I have done deals in the past where you kind of go, Okay, wasn't quite what I thought, but suck it up and go. To actually emphasize how much this was, this was coming into probably the commitment to purchase the building, the five-year lease, all the on cost, everything else. We were probably talking well over five five hundred thousand pounds, which mm. is six seven hundred thousand yep. dollars. And uh, you know, so this is not just a thing. That mm. cash flow and that drive alone is enough to probably put my lights out from a cash flow point of view, mm. not from an asset, but you know, it's enough to dismantle the structure and cause some fierce damage. So this is not just a case of you shook the hand, just suck it up and go. Mm. So I'm now having the wake up call and going, holy moly, this is okay. This is pretty significant. I've got, and bear in mind, this is all happening in 12 days, 12 days. So I might set up my investment profile. I've got all the hopes and wishes and nothing bankable. I've got all the likes and nothing to bank, you know, of all this dreams, ideas, opportunity, potential, and all the rest. And suddenly it just, it just smells wrong. I have a long drive down to see the client. At which point 
I sit down and I go, I can't believe I have to say this, but the deal that we've struck, I cannot honor. And that hurt. That really, really, really hurt. It broke all my mm. values to do that. And I'm scratching my head and I don't know how it's happened and I don't know how I've got so blindsided. And the client, all he could say was, I'm so disappointed. I thought you were a bigger person than that. <laughs> He's not helping. <laughs> yes. And why would he help? You know, to say I was shell shocked is an understatement. That takes a lot for me to say it out loud because yep. my pride, my ego has got, I mean, bash from pillar to post that whole weekend and i actually we decided to to re refresh and revisit back the following week so i sat down with the client again so he's another chance to have a call <laughs> no things to make your suffering twice yeah but you know what i mean it's one of those things you got to face it too yeah you know and that's the one thing. it was the hardest thing i've ever done in turn you know looking someone and, and undoing mm. a handshake and i listen i i it was not done lightly for one second Mm. but it's one of those things when sometimes you got to do so that was my worst investment ever mm. but thank god i didn't do beautiful um so what lessons did you learn um so many don't stack on hope mm. stack on the bankable you know i hope this happens and if that happens i hope that happens and then geez it'll be you know rivers of gold um stick to the model you know or mm -hmm. stick to that don't be rushed into deals you know if something is you know there's very little in life that has to be done now it's a wonderful sales technique it's a great for action taking and all the rest there's not a whole lot in life that has to happen straight away take time because time is an amazing thing you get to pull together the committee of you you get to sleep on it i mean how many people have said you know greatest business people talk about that sleep on it because you get to have your subconscious committee just decide how you feel. When you know enough to be dangerous, but you don't know enough to actually know what you're talking about. Mm. That is a dangerous place. You, ever, you know, you'll have heard of the Donegar's curve. You know, it's like, you call it mind stupid. You know enough to be dangerous. You come in and suddenly you're preaching and kind of, you read a book and suddenly going, why doesn't everyone know this? I need to tell everyone about it. Mm. What happens then is the more you get into it, the more you realize actually you don't know. So then you go into this valley of despair. You go into these things. Of, I've learned enough to get me started, but then I suddenly have started to unpick things. And this is why then you start to come up the far side. You gain wisdom. You've had that high, you've had the low. Suddenly you have the wisdom of experience. And that's when you start to actually become a wise person. You've mm -hmm. had the experience. You've had the fail. You've had the positive. You've had that. So is knowing, realizing when you know enough to be dangerous, but not to be there. Yep. Not everything that shimmers is gold. Just because it looks good and it smells good doesn't mean it is good. And for that, I was emotion driven, not logic driven. I am so grateful for the experience. I'm so before I would have had a lot of mental chatter. And even before my 37 and a half years with depression, a lot of mental health things on the background, you know, which for me were causes, not effects. But, you know, I actually came away from that and I go, I was very, very thankful getting a difference of opinion, breaking March, you know, so it's, you know, it's, it's the, uh, I can't, it's like not the Doppler effect, but it's, it's where there's a bridge in America that actually destroyed itself through the, the frequency of the wind that passed through it. It's back in the 1940s, 1950s. It's a wonderful mm. example. You can look it on Google, um, uh, YouTube. Um, so it goes through, but what happens is it actually, it, it starts to actually move and it sways. Right. It's, I think it's the Doppler effect when you get right. in the car, when eventually you get a perfect moment of, res res of resonance. Right. And when you get that, when all like your committee and everyone else is saying yes together, the problem is you then you gain momentum, but the problem is you have no outside perspective. Mm. So you get an outside perspective. So mm. that's what happens when you get that perfect frequency. It means it's either meant to happen or you're not taking in all the proper inputs. Right. And that's the point where it'll either take off or it'll destroy itself. And I was at that point. Hmm. Um, some of the things I've learned. Yeah. I mean, there's a few things. Uh, I wrote down a lot of notes and it's similar to what you said. I think one of the things is if, if you're on the other side of sales where you're selling the deal, you're constantly wanting to put urgency on the sale. And so I think whenever we're purchasing something, we have to remember that urgency is 
is just a sales tool. Occasionally, urgency is real. You know, if if a property is going to be foreclosed on and this person's got to, you know, wants to get out of it right now, and you know, the, the bank is given a deadline. You know, there's nothing wrong with investigating the 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 realness of the urgency, but I would say majority of time it's not as real as it appears. Um, the other thing you talked about, and I think we I hear that a lot on the show, is if you've got a system that works, don't break the system. And the only time that you know you want to break that system is this is is any time that something comes out of the system, you know, outside of the system, you're like, oh well, this could be different. But stick with your system, and um, that that works well. And I think the final thing is you have a right to protect your own interests, and you know, and that can even mean reneging on a contract. You know, you reneged in a sense on a handshake, but you could literally go to someone and say, I need to get out of this contract and, and say for, for compensation, I'll pay you 5,000, you know, pounds or whatever that would be to say, I'm sorry, but I have to get out. And, you know, it is your obligation to protect your interests of a transaction. That doesn't mean that you cheat, you lie, you steal, but you know, I'll, I'll tell a story about a contract um, story. And that is, I, I had an employment contract with a company and I created a quantitative model that I used at that company. And basically at some point, senior management in the company changed. And then they said that, you know, they didn't need what I was doing anymore. And so um, we had a non-compete clause. I couldn't hire the guy to work with me to develop the uh, software or the, the, the quantitative methodology. And I couldn't, you know, publish the stuff that I had created under them uh, because it was, you know, paid for by them. And so I basically went across the street and I opened up my own uh, company and I implemented immediately exactly what I had done at that company using the property that I had um, developed at their company. Now, I use this in the ethics class where I asked the students, did I break the contract that I break the ethics and the students say, of course you did because you had a non-compete. You hired the guy that worked with you and you also brought the, the concept and the, the, the technology or the know-how uh, and brought it straight over and used it. I said, well, interesting that you mentioned that, but in fact, I did not break the contract. And they said, well, how is that? And I said, because I went to the CEO of the company and I said, you guys have already said that you don't need this and need me. I'm going to ask you right now to release me from that non-compete clause and from the non-solicitation clause so that I can go and put this into action. It's not going to affect you because you guys have already said you don't need it. So would you be willing to do that? And he said, yes. And so I think the lesson from, from what you talked about and kind of that story is that, yes, even contracts are ironclad, but you can as just a, a uh, just you can break through the veil of that by talking one to one with the other person in the contract. So those are some of the things I, I took away from your story. Anything you'd add? It's you know and and talking. I think that's a great thing. You know, it's it's people get caught up in the math. People get caught up in the contracts, and sometimes you know, a face to face and a stiff coffee. Um, that person I'm actually I'm still in touch with today. We still we're looking at other opportunities under a very different. Mm. Uh, energy but as you yep. say sometimes you sit down and go on even a contract it's sometimes not worth the pain of what comes out of a contract yep. you know my, my my wife is a lawyer as well and you know you see sometimes kind of going well the answer is black and white however the opportunity or the emotional penalty is not worth it so there's always things where we kind of sometimes get stuck behind the lawyers or we get stuck behind the math or the finances so sometimes it just takes sense to you know be a person pick up the phone sit down for the coffee have a chat and talk about what you really want yep. and how you feel about it so before i ask you the next question i also just wanted to mention that you know the other lesson is the lesson of getting feedback and that that you did very well so now based on what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate Find out what you're good at and stick at it. You know, have clarity. It's very, listen, this day and age, social media, 50 billion opportunities on our doorstep. Find out what you're good at. 
do it. Rinse and repeat till dead. I can't remember who said that. There was possibly Warren Buffett or some someone else. Do what you're good at. Yes, you can invest in other things, but get people who know what they're doing or, you know, accept that you, you know enough to be dangerous. So find out what you do. Rinse and repeat till dead yep. and all the rest. Farm mm. it out. Great. Last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Building passive assets. Books, podcasts, property, intellectual property, things that can basically work and be working for me while I sleep. Because if I can't have stuff that works for me while I sleep, I'm going to always be working. Right on. All right, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember to go to my worstinvestmentever.com to claim your discount on the course that excites you the most. As we conclude, Pete, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Just be mighty. Be the best version of you and find and live by the fire in your belly. Amen. And, and ladies and gentlemen, go to your podcast, look up fire in the belly and listen to it and grow your fire in your belly. Well, that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and most importantly, protect our wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, undisputed, no challenger, Andrew Stotts, saying I'll see you on the upside.